And you two have worked together on issues too. Yeah, we're believe working it or not. together right oh, now on a couple of issues. Don't tell anybody, it's a secret. <laughs> I don't want to ruin either of your street creds, but um, can, can you tell me about how those conversations, because just because you agree on some issues doesn't mean that you are ideologically aligned. So, how do those discussions go when you are admittedly politically pretty different? I mean, I, you know, there, there aren't as many Democrats in the legislature as I would like, and given the minority situation we're in, uh, and, and regardless of that situation, I, I would never want to approach this job as feeling that there's any group of people that have cooties and that I wouldn't want to work with. Uh, <laughs> nor could I, some uh, <laughs> so. but nor could I possibly afford to as, as a member of the minority. So if there is somebody who I overlap with one percent of the time and disagree ninety nine percent of the time, I will happily find that one percent and work with them any way I can. And there's a little bit more than one percent between me and Wayne. But actually, on on, on civil liberties issues, yeah. we have overwhelming overlap. And I don't remember exactly what it was. It was a couple of summers ago, I think, where you wanted to talk about something, and then I said, by the way, what do you think about working on civil asset forfeiture reform? Mm -hmm. And that started a dialogue which, in which we brought uh, Steve Harris into the room and resulted in ultimately the bill that is now pending in the Senate. I mean, yeah. I just love it when those things come up, and we've worked together with groups and, and with legislators. You would think that yeah. you know, we wouldn't have some common interest, but we do. And I actually think, I don't want to speak for you, but I think we, we overlap on the issue that came up this week on the question of whether bills should get hearings and whether the people of Idaho have a right to, to, to hear them and to see their legislators go on the record. I mean, I feel right now that the committee chairman structure is really used as a means of self-entrenchment. It's a way to shield incumbents from having to go on the record on issues where they might be at risk of alienating some significant part of their constituency. Uh, and so by saying, well, we're just going to shove this bill away where nobody can ever see it, it protects them from ever having to go on the public record and, you know, helps keep them safely in the sphere where they're only ever voting on things that they're, you know, they know that their constituency will be broadly behind them. But I don't think the levers of power should be used for self-entrenchment that way. And I think Wayne might be with me on that. I absolutely agree with that. But not only that, uh, when you bring a bill to the table, um, I happen to think that my conservative ideas are wonderful and I can defend them. And that's why I say to people, I don't mind having a hearing on minimum wage increase. I don't mind having a hearing on Medicaid expansion because I want our ideas to be heard counter to the ideas that some other folks may have. But how, how much of you wanting these votes on the record is also you being able to use that against people, uh, against lawmakers with whom you disagree? I really don't feel like that's part of it. I, I truly don't. I mean, I, I, I just think that if our ideas are good enough, if they're strong enough, they should stand on their own. We should be able to walk into a committee room and explain why a piece of policy is good or bad and not be afraid of having the discussion. I don't feel as if it helps the public very much if we just kind of cower behind process and say, okay, we're just not going to allow for people to have their ideas heard. And both of you have used the word afraid or fear, and I'm curious what that fear is of. Is it of ideas or, or getting in trouble in a primary election? Where does that fear stem from? Uh, well, again, I'm, I'm not one who has fear of these things coming forward for hearing. I would love to see things coming forward for hearing. But I think, you know, the, the fear can take form in, in several ways. There's a fear that folks will have to go on record in a way that will alienate some part of their constituency and expose them in an election. Um, I think that's probably the best way to crystallize the fear. I guess perhaps there's also a fear that... Um, folks when put in the spotlight will feel compelled to vote in a certain way that will cause something to go through that may not ultimately they feel be in the best interest of Idaho. Um, so there might be bills that are perceived as fundamentally dangerous, but that if they come up for a vote, they'll just have to vote for it anyway because of, you know, electoral fears. But there are people out there with really neat ideas, both legislators and folks in the public. And those ideas can't be heard if people are unwilling to have a hearing. I happen to think that this discussion that was held this week with regard to um, Representative Rebell's bill was very, very insightful. I think it helped at least have a broader discussion about the ability and the need for people to get their ideas out there and what those impediments are in our current process to getting to that end.